Hello, everyone, and welcome to this virtual college coach panel brought to you by the American Volleyball Coaches Association and our affiliate partner, the Great Plains Region. My name is Joya Pollard, and I am the membership and communication specialist for the ABCA. And before we get started, I'd just like to give a brief explanation of our partnership. The Great Plains Region is a proud member of the ABCA Region Affiliate Partner Program, or ABCA RAP. The RAP program is designed to link college and youth volleyball by providing regions with information on colleges in their area, familiarizing them with various recruiting rules, providing opportunities for engagement and recognition, and sharing educational materials. The benefits include a region-specific map of college programs, general information on recruiting rules and terminology, a college coaches panel, educational materials for club coaches, and options to participate in ABCA awards. Today's panel will be recorded, so registrants will be able to receive this recording within 72 hours. We will start by having each coach introduce themselves and begin opening with questions. If you do have any questions during this panel, please feel free to type them into the questions box. Let's go ahead and get started with introductions and we'll just go by division. Uh, so Linda, if you could just kick it off for us. Sure, I'm Linda Hampton Keith. Um, Spent 18 years coaching at the Division I level, um, most recently was the head coach at North Carolina State University. Um, spent some time at uh, in the Pac-12, uh, uh, the Big 12, and um, various other conferences as well uh, as a recruiting coordinator. And uh, right now I'm, I'm not working right now. So I'm happy to be here and happy to help in any way that I can. Um, hopefully just learn more about all this fun recruiting stuff. Hi, I'm Jill Stevens. I'm uh, actually a former head volleyball coach at uh, Florida Southern College, where I'm now a senior women's administrator and associate athletic director. Um, I was actually a Division II student athlete as well. I've spent predominantly my whole career in Division II. Um, super passionate about it. So just excited to, you know, share and listen and learn um, from all these coaches. So thanks for signing on. Hi everyone, I'm Matt Joffrey. Um, I'm representing Division Three from the State University of New York at New Paltz. Um, I've been in Division Three my entire career, four as an assistant at another school, and then the past 18 years at New Paltz. And I'm also happy to be with everyone and try to learn a little bit more and, and grow the game a little bit more. Hi, my name is Trish Sedlick. I'm entering my 19th season as a head coach in the NAIA. I was, uh, I've been at Bellevue for 15 years here at Bellevue University, and I also was an NAI student athlete for my college career. I'm Jim Dietz. I'm here for two-year colleges. I'm at Lincoln Land Community College in Springfield, Illinois. Um, before that, uh, I've been here too long. Before that, I spent a decade as a high school coach, about 25 years coaching club, and before that was with Iowa State and Ohio State. Awesome. We also have uh, Lindsay on the line as well. I'm going to let her uh, do a brief introduction. Lindsay? Hi, this is Lindsay with Great Plains. Um, I'm just on here to pretty much any, answer any questions about the status of our Great Plains tournaments or USA Volleyball tournaments. Um, right now, the sanction for the Nebraska High School Association is extended through May 31st for elimination of activities and then USA Volleyball is moved to May 15th. And as of now, all the junior championships for USA Volleyball are still planned on going. All right, thanks, Lindsay. All right, let's go ahead and kick it off with questions. Um, the first question is going to be for everyone, um, and we'll just go by division again. Um, the first question is to please describe your division and how it is different from the others. Um, uh, this is Linda with Division One. Um, I usually end up talking more about how we're alike than different. Um, uh, but I think uh, the biggest things to know about Division One um, is, um, you know, you. One of the things that we talk about a lot 
and I think uh, one of the myths, especially in recruiting that I come across the most is that, you know, division one is a higher level of volleyball uh, and that's not necessarily true. Um, and so I usually end up kind of breaking down kind of just where we are and what kind of questions you should be asking about division one. There are 335 division one volleyball programs in the country. Um, and there's a pretty wide gap um, in terms of a, a lot, um, not just level of play, but resources as well, um, and obviously academics as well. And so um, it's it's a really broad, and I'm sure all the other coaches will also go into it as well with, with their divisions, but it's a pretty, it's a deep and wide breadth of uh, differences even within division one. And so um, just understanding that one of the things I talk about is just understanding the myth of, you know, again, the level of play. Um, top division two and top division three teams would probably beat the, the bottom part of division one probably. Um, and so I think that level of play myth is is one of the things I like to break down first the most. And then understanding that a lot of that has to do with resources um, at the division one level and the variety of resources you've got all the way from your you know, top conferences, power five conferences um, that are gonna obviously be well-funded and, and um, be able to provide uh, the resources to their student athletes to be successful, not only on the court, but in the classroom as well and, and provide an experience that's gonna, again, just create kind of the, I think what everyone kind of envisions, and then you have some really great ma mid-major conferences, um, schools that are in conferences that are in mid-majors, and they, um, same thing, they can, usually can get a really, really great experience and have a lot of resources, but even within the mid-majors, you start getting into um, a wide range of resources that, um, that some schools may have versus others and being fully funded. And so that's one term that I think people don't know recruiting wise that I would ask if I were you is um, how fully funded or how funded is your program? Um, even division one, um, not all division one schools have the full allotted 12 scholarships. And so that's something that I would really just pay attention to um, and ask that question. If, if a school does not have all 12 scholarships, then they are allowed to break them up. Um, uh, but uh, most, if they are fully funded, they will, once you get a scholarship that is a full scholarship, that counts as a full scholarship. Uh, and so just, again, those are questions you want to ask about how fully, how funded are they? Um, also, the fun, fully funded also means not just scholarships, but also staffing. Are they fully funded with the staff? Are they able to have um, uh, the fully allotted staff that the NCAA allows you? Um, also, uh, and then just overall funding of their budget of are they, you know, are they getting um, resourced enough to be able to provide, you know, academic help that you would want, to, uh, that you would expect at that level and um, even all the way down to the gear that you're going to get. So I think those are just one of the big things I would ask and one of the big myths and discrepancies I find in recruiting is that everyone thinks division one, they think really high level and think really lots of lots of stuff. You know, you're going to get a full scholarship and you're going to get all this stuff. And I think that that is very much um, dictated and determined by um, the conference that the institution is in and what those what that means for that particular institution. And um, and again, there's lots of lots and lots of D2 programs I know would for sure uh, compete and probably beat a lot of Division I teams. So that to me, as far as the difference goes, is I just like to break down that myth because um, there's not a ton of differences other than maybe I'm not sure what the time allotment is at um, Division II or Division Three. I don't think there's any at Division Three, but um, you know we do have the 20 hour a week um, obligation for um, division one meaning when we're in season we have a 20-hour limit um, but that does not include your study hall that doesn't include your training room time that you put in to prepare for practice or any time that you would put in after it doesn't include rehab time that may be mandated through your sports medicine so um so it's a it's it's a little misleading um, because you think 20 hours and you're like, oh, it's like a part time job. And it really is, does become a full time job, at, especially at the higher levels where your travel is also you may leave on a Thursday and come back on a Sunday. And so your travel is um, taking up a lot of your time as well. Uh, and you just do have a lot of demands on your time. And so um, that's, again, the biggest things, the biggest differences in terms of the experience that you may get. Um, and that's a wide it's again all the way from 
you'll get lots of stuff and expect and a lot of will be expected of you to um, you know not not as much and again just depending on the experience and the level of resources that an institution can provide for you so that's pretty much the difference with division one from my perspective awesome linda i love your hat by the way it's awesome <laughs> love it um okay so division two uh i think the best thing the way to describe it is division two's kind of tagline is life in the balance so we're looking at a lot of being a great um, student so the academics are super high we're looking for great students because we package money with not only volleyball money but academic money um, we do have eight scholarships that's our full allotment but like Linda said resources could be very different depending on where you go so that's a great question to ask of how many scholarships do you have in division two we can have eight but academically um, this always surprises a lot of people that like for instance like nursing is one of our one of our top majors and in a lot of schools especially division one it's really tough to be a nursing major or pre-med or something that takes a lot of time in the classroom whereas we thrive in that area we have lots of nursing students that are student athletes and they love it they love that they're leaders on campus and whatnot so but in academics one of the nice things too is we do a lot of regional scheduling so travel is not you know you don't you might drive three hours and come back, right? Like, or you're sleeping in your own bed a lot and you're missing a lot less class time compared to some other, you know, some other divisions where you're traveling and flying every trip. Um, so academics are awesome. Athletics are huge. You know, obviously the, the volleyball piece of it, we're playing at a high, very high level. And again, that varies depending on where you're looking. You wanna look, you know, what kind of season did they have last year? How long has their coach been there? You know, is there turnover? A lot of times you see in Division Two coaches that stay a very long time. They have great careers. And um, so I think that's a big piece of it. But also, we find that a lot of student athletes choose Division Two because they want to play for national championship. They don't want to just play to get into a conference tournament. They want to play to try to win a national title. And, you know, and, and again, depending on which institution you're looking, institution you're looking at, um, that's a big thing. And then the other piece, the other part of the balance is just having a social life. You do have a lot of demands and you do have a lot of, um, you know, it's very intense and it's very, high, very highly competitive. But in the same token, we want our student athletes to have a life. We want them to be able to uh, enjoy the community, um, to have community engagement, uh, go and do community service within and help and give back to the um, to the people in our community. And then our last thing I think is that we really focus on the love of the game. We want people who want to play volleyball and want to just love and enjoy the game as opposed to it being kind of a job. Um, so we're looking for passionate, self-motivated student athletes. We don't have, a lot of times division two, we don't have, we're not able to bring them in, the student athletes in over the summer. So we have to depend on them to be ready to go, you know, training all summer, being fit, and then ready to go first of the uh, first of August to be ready for preseason. So. That's kind of it in a nutshell, D2. Uh, with Division Three, I first want to say I appreciate uh, my colleagues on here recognizing that Division Three can be as competitive and as, as time commitment and, and whatnot as disciplined as the other divisions. Oftentimes we get a bad rap because it's like, oh, Division Three, it's not, it's not as high a level. And, and in some cases that might be true or it's not as serious. And um, for someone that spent his entire career in Division Three, I kind of beg to differ on that. Uh, biggest thing with Division Three is first, uh, we are the biggest of the three divisions and the largest. We've got about 450 schools um, all over the country. There's certainly a concentration in, in certain areas, but um, and similar to the other divisions, there's there's a wide range of of opportunities. Um, you know, there's a big difference in in some cases between public schools and private schools, um, but essentially, you know, for the most part, student athletes need to meet the same or very similar admission standards as any other student. Um, when they're in season where there's a, a heavy time commitment between uh, practice and individuals and film and lifting and, and things of that nature we don't have to worry about a, a number of hours per week uh, we have to make sure they get one day off full day off in a calendar week of seven days um, there's no money involved athletically either on or off the record um, and I'm asked that question oftentimes in, in both cases what can you do and then when I say nothing, I get asked again, well, really, what can you do? And again, I say nothing. Um, I think another piece to Division Three that's important is there's a lot of um, self-discipline and a lot of self-leadership involved. Our, the, a, a huge difference, I think, is our off-seasons, uh, 
and that we can have with our student athletes is much uh, more limited than the other divisions, particularly spring semester. So we need to um, make sure that our athletes are engaged and value their experience so that they continue to do the things that uh, we, we want them to do or we provide them to do um, to be able to have a, a championship level uh, type experience. And I don't mean necessarily trophy championship, just a, a high quality experience. Um, so it takes a lot. We have to develop our students quite a bit in leadership and self-discipline areas um, because I can't in person oversee everything that they're doing, particularly in the off season. And I think that's a major, uh, a major difference. It also affords them the time to invest in other uh, hobbies and other uh, campus or community engagement and to sometimes find out what else they like to do in life that they haven't had time for, maybe as a high school student multi-sport and multi-club uh, student athlete. So that's kind of a cool opportunity in Division Three as well. Uh, this is Trish uh, Sedlick from the NAI. Uh, we do not have any rules. Uh, that's kind of a perk for NAI. We don't have any recruiting rules, I would say. I think I started off that last time. Uh, another cool thing about NAI is we do not have substitution rules. So with our roster sizes on our teams, we are able to have large numbers and still uh, be able to utilize that to our a strategy situation, serving defense, whatnot. Um, we do have a 24 week year allowed. So our weeks that we can be with our student athletes anytime, no limit, is August 1st to May 15th. So until tomorrow, um, then that's our, that's kind of our clock for that. Uh, a lot of the NAI students that choose NAI are for the smaller classroom sizes. Maybe it, we're a local school. Um, and, uh, but we have 200, over 225 schools and growing. Uh, to some of the schools deciding to hop into NAI due to, to the economy actually right now. So that number could grow. Many student athletes, um, let's see here, uh, some of our schools, some of those low division one schools like uh, Coach Linda had, had mentioned and uh, upper division two schools. I know I'd like to brag a little bit and I'm sure Coach Squires would not like this being a Nebraska person, but uh, Bellevue did beat Kearney in an exhibition match last year and with them in the national championship we were really pulling for them. Um, but as far as scholarships could range anywhere from a full ride, which is everything, uh, to a full tuition, to a half tuition, uh, but definitely stacked with academic money. Uh, so we don't really have any limits with that. Some schools also say they give a percentage of uh, institutional money for that. Um, with the requirements, and this kind of goes along with NCAA too, with some minor uh, adjustments, but you must have an 18 ACT, a 2.0 or higher, and, and the, or two of the three categories, so ACT, GPA, and be in your upper 50th percentile. This year, due to COVID, though, they have dropped those two out of three requirements, and basically you have to have a 2.0. If you did not um, meet the upper 50th percentile, or if you were not able to take the ACT again. So they did weigh that only for this next year. Uh, so that's the NAI. Um, two year schools run the gamut. Out on the Great Plains, you primarily have division one and division two community colleges. Division, well, so I'll start with the D3s. Uh, they're exactly like NCAA. They don't give any scholarships except based on need and academic. Uh, the closest ones to you guys are in Minnesota or down in Texas. Otherwise, you've got D1 and D2s. The D1s have full scholarships that pay for everything. Um, the two closest are probably Nebraska Western, Western Nebraska and Iowa Western. You also have quite a bit of the Jayhawk Conference, um, which is Division One. Half of the Jayhawk is Division Two, along with Central, Southeast, and Northeast Nebraska. Uh, on up to like South Dakota, it's South Dakota, North Dakota Tech. Division two community colleges can pay for all of your tuition, all of your fees, but they cannot pay for any of your housing. So that it's a inexpensive option. The difficulty is also the advantage. We have them for two years. There is no sit on the bench for two or three years, told that you'll play down the road. Um, only to find that you're benched because of recruiting down the road. You come in, you're playing right away. 
because many community colleges are playing 40 to 50 matches right every year. So that by the time you're ready to transfer, you play 300, 400 sets. Um, and when you're recruited out of a two-year school to go to a four-year school, you are not recruited to sit the bench there. You're expected to be able to come in and start right away. So the advantage of a two-year school is there's not going to be a whole lot of bench time with those programs. The disadvantage is you're going to go through the recruiting process a second time, which means you have to really trust the two-year college coach knows what they're doing when it comes to placing you. And you should check that record very closely for that coach because the danger is there are two-year coaches who will recruit players who can play. They will ignore the academic requirements. And when you're done at that two-year school, you are done whether you wanted to or not because you're not going to be eligible to play at a D1, 2, 3, or NAIA school. And so you need to be very careful, uh, always checking transfer requirements. Awesome. All right. Next question um, is pretty much for everyone, I guess. Um, there may be some similarities and differences with this, but I'll start off with um, Matt. If you could tell us how early do you start the recruiting process? Uh, it seems to be getting earlier and earlier, whether I'm ready for it or not. Um, but in general, uh, 11th grade. Uh, might be a little bit later than the other divisions. Uh, sometimes uh, prospects are kind of waiting to see what happens with financial opportunities at the Division One or Division Two schools they might be looking at before really opening up um, Division Three as an option. Uh, once in a while, I'll get tenth graders sending me a note, but I kind of just you know do a thanks for thanks for getting in touch and um, we'll I'll, I'll get back to you type thing. But really in 11th grade, I'm finding that um, when the rule changed in Division Three a couple of years ago where you can make official visits after January 1st of 11th grade, that really changed recruiting quite a bit for us. Um, because while we used to have to wait till the fall of senior year to do overnights, we can bring them in um, sometime in, after January 1st, like I said. So that really changed the landscape quite a bit. So it now seems to be summer of 11th grade year. Um, I'm starting to get inundated with um, outreach and then certainly when I'm on the road uh, watching you know uh, different tournaments and whatnot um, if I find out they're 11th or 12th it's kind of a more immediate outreach to the coach than if they're younger than that um, at this point in time and a couple of years from now that may change once again. Uh, same with what Matt said for NAI uh, we Again, probably uh, if a 10th grader wrote us, we're like, whoa, that's awesome, but hold the phone here. Uh, wait and be a kid still a little bit. Uh, junior year, same thing. I would say NAI does a good job of still trying to get our foot in the door and then wait for reality to set in. Maybe this kid isn't going to get the offer that they wanted or they decide that I want to stay closer to home with a lot of NAI schools try to tend to recruit locally, but not necessarily. So that I would agree with a lot with Matt said. I think in division two, um, I think I would say like AUs of the sophomore year would be a big, normally a, a like kind of a big time for our coaches to really start recruiting, but not to say they wouldn't during their sophomore year. And again, everybody's a little different. Um, for instance, I was a little more patient on the patient's side. And now I stress my assistants out all the time because they're like, we don't, you know, we don't have early commitments. But I'll tell you when I, um, this is always something I looked at. And I looked at our last, like, nine All-Americans, eight of them, and this is a flabbergasting number, but eight of them we committed in March or April of their senior year. And that's super late. But some of them were transfers from different levels. Um, but there were quite a few um, just unsigned seniors that were just diamonds in the rough and they didn't find the right fit and were just really patient or maybe something fell through. And um, so I know this is a really scary time for especially juniors who feel like we don't have a lot of recruiting. We're not getting recruited. But you know, I think there everyone there, there's always that Las Vegas. I don't know if it still is, but the Las Vegas senior showcase 
And every year I would go thinking, okay, I'm going to find this great player because nobody else is looking. The division ones are all done, but everyone is always looking late because things happen. And there's, unfortunately, players don't always find the right fit and they're transferring. But I think it's really crucial to be patient and make sure that you find the right fit and don't just jump on something because you got an offer and then be unhappy in a year or two. So that would be my big plug for today is just, you know, know that coaches are always looking and even the, the big coach, you know, division ones, I'm standing next to, you know, Ohio state or, you know, university of Florida and they're all last minute looking and it's like, get out of here. This is the, you know, so I think that's something you want to um, just be aware of that a lot of coaches take a patient approach or things happen in programs where things open up. So. Yeah, I'll jump in and piggyback off what Jill said. For Division One, I, I think we're the notorious division for trying to try to go really early, especially the higher levels um, tend to, I mean, and I mean, it's been, I think, seventh and eighth graders as young as uh, committing um, and, and anything in between. I think normal, you know, normal, quote unquote, normally, um, it was it would be very common for us to finish a, um, a recruiting class while they were in early in their sophomore year. Uh, would be pretty the typical timing. However, our Division One I, I think is still very much in this um, shifting time because of the rule changes that just came out about. I think well, it's been about it's been over a year now, but it's now settling in. I think in terms of the classes that it's affecting, um, and so now they have stopped all communication until June one before your junior year, and so whereas before. Um, you know, any kind of initiated conversations or communications, um, anything that was initiated by the PSA, the prospective student athlete, um, we could have those, you know, have those conversations, those all ended. Um, and, you, you know, no, the only kind of, the only opportunities for any kind of engagement with a PSA would be through camp. And so I think that's why I don't, think we're even there yet in terms of seeing the where that's really going to leave everything in terms of when are people going to commit because obviously then then this wonderful time came along and everything's really standing still for everyone not just you know just the recruits so I don't really know what the impact that's going to have yet I don't think we're going to know that for probably another full year to see really how what the rhythm of recruiting is really going to end up being um, in terms of commitments and things like that I know the 21 class really kind of went fast because because they were they were getting caught uh, right in the as those rules were changing um and so i think i know people rushed to finish their 21 class and kind of said okay 22 if you're 2022 or 2023 we kind of clamp the brakes on and and we're going to kind of wait that out so of course um the 2022 class i'm sure is you know that as they are kind of ramping up and going into this time period where you're about to go into your junior year you've now you know not been playing club for a long time so i'm sure that's very stressful for everyone um and so you know we can continue to talk about what are some ways we can deal with that but uh, overall in terms of the the earliness if you will of recruiting for division one i don't know if we're we're just kind of we're in this like shifting sands moment still and i don't know we haven't settled in yet and so um you know i'm sure there's still a lot of 2021s that are still available and and same thing you're going through this and so this is just a stressful time for everyone um even 2020 you know even people that are seniors uh, you know there may be still some unsigned seniors out there i'm sure so um but yeah i think so to answer your question is i don't know as for for division one right now because it's so different right now and um it, it used to be common to be eighth ninth tenth grade uh ninth tenth grade more normally i mean eighth graders would be like you know really 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 high level no-brainer kind of athletes that um the top top schools are going after and getting commitments from um but now i think i i don't know what that's going to look like in a year from now um i'm hoping and the hope and the goal of the rule changes were to slow things down to allow you to be kids you know just allow you to enjoy your high school experience without stressing over college and i i used to laugh even doing um you know unofficial visits which you can't do anymore you know and like you know you're sitting here we're talking about an experience you're going to have four years from now you're we're talking about four years of your life in four years so we're like we're talking like years ahead here and it's really really difficult to project anything that far out and so um so i think that's i'm hoping and i'm hoping that we settle into a more um a more recruit friendly 
um, timeline for everyone with these new rules and that it allows you to kind of free you up to just be you and develop as an athlete and as a person your freshman and sophomore years and then hopefully as you you know we can kind of open the the window back up if you will going into your junior year where you you know that that seems appropriate to be start to, starting to think about you know at least by then maybe you can operate a motor vehicle which i would always laugh too i'm like you're making a decision about college and you can't even operate a motor vehicle by yourself yet so seems like it's a logical progression that you would be able to drive a car before you decide uh where you're going to go to college so um so i don't know when where, that, where that's going to end up ultimately but i do appreciate the new rules that it kind of slows things down for the recruits because um I think that's helpful um, as you in your just overall growth and development as a human being. So, um, so we'll see. We'll see where this all lands us in a, in a year. So, next question. I have a, sorry, I was gonna. I was gonna add yeah, to that. Right. If Jim, you were gonna go there, or Jim, did you want to go? Nah, that's enough on that. <laughs> I was going to add to this because this came up uh, in in talks around the state here. Uh, but if you verbally commit to a school, that does not mean that you are signed. You verbally commit to a school, that coach or you yourself can decide to go to another school in the meantime. That coach can tell you, you know what, it didn't work out. We found someone else. It just fell into our lap. I'm really sorry we don't, I mean, as far as that goes, it's not very cool, but it happens. And so until you sign that letter of intent, and I don't know if the coaches can talk about that too, you are not technically with that school officially, so. Um, okay, now you're gonna get me to rant, actually. Um, <laughs> because we lost a kid a week and a half ago. We had a commitment, but somebody from a different div letters of intent for the NCAA have no bearing on the NAIA or NJCAA. You can commit to one and sign something else else without any penalty. We had a kid sign and we had a NCAA Division I school come in and tell the kids sign here instead. It's only a JUCO. As soon as I find out who that school is, I will spread the word. You In the recruiting process, it is all about integrity and honesty. You as a recruit and a recruit parent need to be honest with the school you're talking to. And if you make a commitment, you need to honor that. If I, I, I would tell you that if I tell a kid, I will send you the scholarship paperwork the first day I am eligible to, and then your daughter has her leg fall off and she will never play volleyball again, I will still send that letter of intent because I gave my word. So, Throughout the entire process with this, make sure you are keeping your word. Use your club coaches and club directors. Use the resources around you because they know who keeps their word and they know who does not and who is questionable in the world of coaches. Ethics run the spectrum from completely 100% honest to total weasel. Make sure you figure out who you're dealing with in the recruiting process. Sorry to rant. All right, next question. Um, as we're talking about recruiting uh, athletes and such, um, I'll, this next question, I'll uh, kick it over to Trish. Um, what are your thoughts on multi-sport athletes? We love them because not only is it multi-sport, but if they're multi-activity and it's a helpful tool to balance their schedules as an athlete, uh, if they're in choir, if they're in band, if they are in clubs, if they are in other things, we know that they're not going to be more than likely not burnt out. And as far as NAI goes, there are some multi-sport athletes where you can stack scholarships, so that's helpful. They gotta be a very good student athlete, but that is something that uh, has been uh, common at our level. A lot of volleyball players are also track. Uh, so that's two, two different seasons. Uh, so I love them. I love that they're also uh, some of our better athletes and our better students. 
Um, I'm, I'm, I think this applies a lot to Matt as well as D3. At certain levels, multi-sport athletes, you have the option to do both. Um, we have volleyball and basketball. We've had volleyball and softball in the past. Those are our, our, our women's sports. Um, and I, I think that's valuable in high school with multiple activities. And you can encourage to do that at, at certain levels. Um, I think it's incredible. Um, and if you're doing that in high school, when you contact coaches, make sure to emphasize that, hey, I also play basketball. Hey, I run track. Hey, did you know that I'm on the dance team? I'm in theater. Um, because you never know what other opportunities you want to pursue at the college level. And certain levels, that's not just a possibility, it's encouraged. Mm -hmm. I think I've been here. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, for Division One, I, I think you know it. This may this isn't necessarily reflective of all Division One or coaches in the Division One level. My I guess it would be more my either personal recruiting philosophy or my pro the program I would be working with philosophy. But we were very much um, open to multi sport athletes. Um, it didn't always happen. Again, I think at the Division One level, there's some other um, things that come into play that you have to kind of navigate um, that are difficult. Um, I've gone through the process of you know dealing with. Um, you know, a couple of recruits who are looking to play both volleyball, and basketball. It is very difficult just from a timing standpoint because uh, basketball tends to start in October, right, when we're getting going. And um, then there's some scholarship issues that come along with that as well of whose dime are you on kind of a thing. But the point is, <laughs> so we were open to it. It didn't actually ever happen. Um, but I've gone down that road at least two or three times in the process and really worked through all of the um, kind of how would we handle these things that would come up. And because we were open to it, we were open to um, at least having the discussion and seeing if we could make it work. And I think even in just the recruiting, again, I think we're always attracted to people who have shown um, the ability to be able to navigate different schedules because um, it's very much what you're going to have to do at the college level. You're going to have a lot of demands on your time and a lot of demands on your attention. And if for someone to be able to navigate multiple sports, multiple activities, and to be able to um, stay organized through all of that is very much an indicator of potential future success, not volleyball success, not athletic success, but just life success because um, I think I've, I've said this multiple times and, you know, what, what, what kind of catches people when they get, you know, talking about transfers, it's, um, to me, it's usually not, I mean, there's your typical transfers of like, hey, I'm not getting playing time, that makes sense, you want to, you know, find another option or a program that's going to fit your athletic needs better. But most of the time, I would say eight or nine times out of the 10 of the times that you're seeing transfers, it's not because of the athletics, it's because of some kind of um, you know cultural thing you know in terms of you're not a good fit with the culture of the program or you're um, it's just difficult to manage whatever situation you may be in it's it's very rarely a lot of times about the actual volleyball itself it's more comes down to how are you managing and how does does your kind of personal philosophy align with the culture and philosophy of the program that you're in and does that allow you to be successful is, is the environment that you're in um, a, an environment that's allowing you to thrive and and that's when you see conflict and a lot of transfer so anyway so you know do we do we see a lot of multi-sport athletes not really but not because we didn't want to it's because there's been some kind of myth perpetuated that as college coaches we want to see you be a middle all your life forever and ever and if you don't do that somehow you're going to miss out on an opportunity and that's just simply not true so uh, we love multi-sport athletes i think in division two the um i would say the multi-sport athletes that we've seen the most is beach right like there's been a lot of beach and indoor players that are doing that i think that's reasonable in some programs like in, in at florida southern they don't really like them all they don't like them to play both sports but in some institutions, there are crossover sports out there. They're crossing over between the two sports all the time. Um, but similar to Linda, it's you know, it's not. It's more of a just really hard to do. I was a two-sport athlete. I actually played volleyball and basketball, but it was a long time ago, and it, but it was difficult. I only did it two years, and um, so. But don't let anybody tell you you can't do it. You know, if if that's you, what you're passionate about and what you have your heart set on, then go try to find an institution that will allow you to do it. That's what I did, and that's you know. I think it's important to follow your, you know, your dreams and your passions. 
the in, in in division three it comes up quite a bit um i think it kind of goes back to there is no athletic money involved so it's about the experience you kind of want to carve out for yourself um overall um i've had prospects or i've had recruits commit to new pods because we were very are very open to the, to the idea of multi-sport athlete i've had some not come to new pods because we didn't off, we don't offer the other sport that they compete in for example we don't have track and field so a volleyball track and field athlete that wants to do both will um, shouldn't come to us i should say uh it is challenging and i think that the fear sometimes on the prospects part is will i be able to handle everything can i handle school and two sports and all those things and, and the reality is yeah you can you have to realize you make some time sacrifices maybe in other things um i currently right now have volleyball basketball and i have volleyball lacrosse um, my setter is the lacrosse goalie um and one of my outside hitters who actually is graduating um this weekend also was a an all-american on the basketball team and she was an all-conference high level all-region player for us so i think one of the challenges that uh, they both face is you know in the one case she finished volleyball practice get a grab a, a protein bar out of her locker and sit and watch basketball practice um, and the basketball coach was great about not asking her to really do anything physical but wanted her to be there so she's in the gym for at least four hours plus if we have lift or a film or or something beyond that and in the other case um, she misses fall ball for lacrosse and spring volleyball um, so there's some reps involved and and some things that she needs that she sometimes tries to do to catch up a little bit but the biggest challenge i think has not has little to do with academics um, has little to do with time. I think the biggest challenge is making sure to develop healthy relationships with both sets of teammates, with both, both sets of coaching staffs, and really know, okay, I'm, I'm in season with this. I, I still love you guys, but I'm, I have to be committed to this right now. And that does take some time, and it takes a balance, and it takes um, um, a little bit of trial and error to do. But I think in, in all the cases I've had of multi-sport athletes, at the end of their career was that was the biggest challenge to make sure that they felt like they were giving of themselves equally um, to both programs and not showing a perception of favoring one or the other because that could become an ugly um, locker room situation but i think that it's something that if it's on your mind to do and, and important to you then do it and at worst um, get yourself out of it if it's not working but you know don't fear it and then regret it go after it and, and if it works out um, you know, keep going with it. Awesome. Okay, this next question is actually um, going to be for uh, Matt, but everybody can chime in with their own opinions. Um, because coaches cannot attend any club tournaments or anything at this time, I'm pretty sure everybody is watching a lot of film. So what are you actually looking for when you're watching an athlete's film for the first time? Um, I mean, all the typical stuff, athleticism, um, you know, footwork. Um, I like to say, are you where the ball is when you're supposed to be? Um, are you kind of looking to the right things? I think on film, you can get a little bit on body language. You can get a little bit of camaraderie, but it's basically, um, it's some of the basic stuff. How well can you play the game? And, and based on experience, how well do I think you can keep growing in the game? Um, you know, I, I obviously can, you could talk to any coach in any division. You know, is height a big deal? It can be, it doesn't have to be. Um, you know, how do you capture athleticism? I think sometimes, you know, you can, you can rubric it. I think sometimes you just know it when you see it. Um, you know, part of it is also where, where are we at roster-wise and depth-wise? Um, you know, and if I already have, I don't know, four liberos, then you better be, you know, among the top two, or um, you may have just been born in the wrong year. You know, so I think I think that's a lot of it. Um, if I could just real quick on on film, if I could give a pet peeve of mine, um, I think that I think you have to know the difference between making a highlight film for your for your virtual scrapbook and making a highlight film that's going to college coaches. Um, tell me what color you're wearing and where you're starting and what number you are, and I'm good. But the the pauses with the arrows and the fireworks and all of those things can get very um, challenging to accurately evaluate you. Uh, and the bad and, music. And the bad and music. At least the music we can turn off, but we can't cut the pauses out of the 
the the highlight and the explosions. Um, so I think I would be very cautious about that. You know, right now we're at a spot where we can't see anybody in person. So you know, highlight film is very beneficial. But if you have or, or you should have, if you're making highlights, you should also have full matches. You're going to want to be able to send those things out upon request as well, because we also I, I need to see something unedited. And if I can't do it in person, I've got to be able to do it from my laptop. Um, so make sure you have that handy uh, that you can include in any either email or follow-up conversation. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear what others have to say as well. But the, the pet peeve is the is the pause to to blow up, you know, zero in on you. I want to see fluid action. Um. I, I looked for a couple of odd things that you wouldn't normally expect. Um, I like watching mistakes. Highlight films is everything you do well. I like seeing how you react to mistakes. There are certain things I coach better than others. There are certain mistakes I don't think I fix very well. There are others that I think I can fix in five minutes that, that maybe Matt can or maybe Trish can't. Um, that's important to me. But I also like watching um, it unedited so I can see how the recruit is acting during a timeout or when they're on the bench because volleyball talent is one thing, attitude is another. And the last thing a coach really wants to do is bring a bad attitude onto the team. And if you're sitting there not paying attention to the coach during the timeout or your, or your teammates aren't, aren't, I don't know, putting an arm around you, they, they're not including you. That, that's a yellow flag of store. Um, so I like watching for the little stuff you wouldn't necessarily expect. I think one thing to keep in mind too is that we get inundated with emails all day long. Um, and so if you're going to send out a video, um, I completely agree. Like I don't wanna only just see highlight films or anything, but I, at the same time, I'm so inundated with film and I'm not gonna watch, I can't, I don't, I physically don't have the time to watch a 10 minute video from every single person that sends video. And so catch our attention right out of the gate with whatever your best skill is, which hopefully isn't serving, but um, you know, we don't need to see serving right away, but um, you know, catch our attention with your athleticism and your skill, because um, especially if you're dealing with, um, you know, uh, higher level division one schools, the first thing we're gonna ask ourselves is, can you, do you make our gym better, right? Physically, cause you can be the most amazing person in the world and amazing, but if you are making, or you're not physically making our gym better um, with whatever that means for that school or that conference, if, you can, if you're not helping us take a step forward in the conference, um, then then we're gonna move on like that and you know hey we love you but you know we're we're looking for something a little bit different uh, and so if you think you physically have um the gifts to play at a high level go ahead and highlight that out of the gate in the first 30 seconds because we're going to continue to move on if you're really good and skilled at your position like liberos that's hard to say it's like how high you jump is a little irrelevant if you're a libero so you know you don't need to obviously lead with that so you know show us how good you are right out of the gate and then we can always come back and ask for more film which we will which if, if you've caught our attention on film and we can't come out and see you play in person we're going to ask for more and more film we're going to ask for the unedited film that um, both the coaches were talking about we're going to ask for hey just let it play and i want to see your mistakes we're going to do all of that but i do think just from a time um respecting people's time standpoint go ahead and try and catch our attention right out of the gate um because we do we have video goggles too we call them our video goggles like we'll 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 spend some time watching a kid and think on video we like them and we get to them in person and it may not or vice versa we see a kid on film and we're like hey you didn't really catch my attention but then i happen to cruise by your court and make sure just to get eyes on you to make sure and we're like oh whoa this is totally different so we we have video goggles too sometimes and so video um I, I personally have never, the only video decisions that I've ever made as a coach, just based only on video, have been international kids where maybe we couldn't fly overseas to see them play in person. That is the only, I have never ever made a yes or no scholarship decision just on video alone. I We have to see play in person and obviously that can't happen right now. So video does become more important in this um, and so, just be ready with all of the things that coaches have mentioned before. Um, you know, have have a small 
portion ready, maybe three minutes or less, but have uncut video available as well. Um, just be ready to with whatever it is we need at this moment. Um, uh, and again, no, yeah, no graphics. I'm okay with like an arrow saying here I am because numbers don't always show up on video very well. Even colors get a little distorted sometimes. So I'm okay with like an arrow, but no slowing down, no slow mo, no um, the best best slash worst video I've ever seen ever. I think I still saved it because it's um, a gem. Uh, is you know every time a kid hit the ball, there would be fireworks and um, the ball would like explode and it was very, very um, entertaining, but I don't know if it helped her recruiting very much because uh, it, we just passed it around to recruiting coaches and watched it for the entertainment value and not for the actual skills. So not all, graphics are not needed in, in, your, um, in your video, just your skills, just bring you. Uh, next. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, uh, just to add to what everyone else said, um, a lot of these people that are on this uh, webinar are from Nebraska. And I would say if you are from Nebraska, you use it as a golden ticket. Uh, in your subject line, you put from Nebraska, class of whatever, maybe even your GPA and position, that's your subject line. And then already I can tell if I want it or if I need to pass on it based on what my needs are as a coach. And then as far as skill videos go, some coaches like skill videos, some like your game footage, just to, again, to play and let's see how you interact with your teammates. If you're given a hive or no one ever goes over to you uh, because after every kill you're, you're standing there, you know, fist pumping. Uh, but as far as skill videos go, they're nice, but we also know after about the 20th hit on there, you look exhausted. And most of them are off a toss or you're lucky enough to have a setter that came in for you. And lastly, oh, uh, two more two more points. Uh, one thing when we do go to these, um, the, the qualifiers, I'm losing my brain here, the qualifiers in, in any other of these huge tournaments, sometimes we are trying to get to 20 courts in a matter of an hour. And I know it's a coach's decision, but if you could wear your uniform number or something that identifies your jersey number, so when I come to watch you on a warm up court, I can already identify you and I don't have to wait for that game to already take place. And then also, if you didn't get to play that set or that match, I missed you because you, I didn't know who, which one you were and warm up. So, as far as the rest of that goes with the highlight part of it, the letter writing. In your letter, please try to do your best. And then the time is immense right now. Write a letter to your coach or this coach and make it personal. Do not write a form letter. Actually say, Coach Matt, I saw you guys were in the conference tournament this year. Coach Jim, I saw that you you are whatever. You, you, you guys won this huge match against your rival. Go say those personal things and you're gonna get our attention. That's all that I have. All right. Um, next question, I'll kick over to uh, Jill. This is a very general question, but how do I know if a school is interested in me? Yeah, this is always tricky. Um, I always, this doesn't really apply to right now because we don't have camps, but one of the trickiest questions is always, you know, um when we're coaches and we're hosting camps people ask well am i in your top three or am i in your top five i'll come to your camp if i'm in your top five because i think everybody thinks that coaches just want kids to come to camp so they can make more money but really camps are such a vital part at least in division two of seeing people in person getting to spend actual physical time with them um and so I think that's difficult to do because like Linda said, I would I would never recruit or offer a scholarship to somebody I hadn't seen in person, uh, except an international. So you're in a situation where you really want to have them on your campus or see them in person. And it just depends on how many times you've had a chance to evaluate. So I would say if you're having conversations, physical conversations, Zoom calls, and like Trish said, you want to you want to make sure you're selling yourself and make yourself available and take the initiative to 
say, hey, you know, have that personal email and say, I would like to set up a Zoom call with you. Um, and then see if they say, okay, then if they say, okay, and they're going to spend the time to Zoom with you or to physically get on a phone call with you, then it's pro they're probably at least interested enough to say, yeah, you, that's interest. If you're getting letters, form letters that you might write to them that, that you're receiving that are kind of like general in nature, then maybe it's not as high of an interest. So, and you can always ask, like, am I, you know, how, where am I in your recruiting list? And they may come back and say, I haven't seen you enough, you know, and then you have to decide, is it worth my time to con continue to pursue this, you know, seeing if I can make an impact in this coach's mind that, yes, I'm a good fit. Um, but I think a lot of it is right now it's taking the initiative to set, try to set up a Zoom call. And if they do, then I would guess that they have at least a certain level of interest. Um, building on that kind of with the recruiting tip, don't just ask, am I your number five? Um, one of the best players I ever had for attitude, she was okay, um, would have recruited her. And she sat there and like, well, am I on your top of your list? I will always be honest, I said no. And then she asked the question and moved her up, what can I do to make me number one on your list? And I said, well, you need to work on like these three things. And then she stayed in touch with me every week. She didn't pester me, but regularly, hey, here's a little clip. Is this looking better? Is this looking better? And eventually we signed her, even though she's like a 5'5 five, five outside hitter, she wound up putting the kill down that got us to nationals because she had an incredible attitude that was infectious. It wasn't pestering me, but I loved the attitude of what can I do to make you want me? I think especially during these times, again, this idea you've got to just to be proactive and it's, it's per perfectly appropriate to ask the question, where am I? And I think that gets some somewhere, I don't know if that you think it's rude or whatever, but I think it's very appropriate and it's appropriate on the coaches part to say, hey, here's where we are in the process. We're looking for this position or here's where you are. And I, I, I hesitate, I don't, I don't like the whole, you're number one, you're number two, like I, just cause I, it, it seems disingenuous to me personally. Like, I don't, like, I don't wanna be like, oh, I'm your number two, but I moved up to one. Cause I don't know what, you know, it just seemed, I don't know, ranking seems odd to me, but, you know, I would say like you're, we are very seriously considering you and, you know, we're only considering so many. And so you're very high on the list. Um, but I, I do think it's very appropriate to ask, and, uh, you know, how serious is this? It's like dating, like, right? At some point you have to define the relationship. And so, you know, you want to make sure that you're not just spinning your wheels. And, um, and again, you have to decide how much time and how much effort you want to put into developing those relationships, because at the end of the day, um, you know, that's what that's what this recruiting is. It's just building relationships and, and deciding and trying to figure out there's going to be a lot of coaches you um, can see yourself playing for, and there's probably a lot of coaches that you can't see yourself playing for. And so trying to figure out as you are trying to figure out who they are, also trying to understand who you are and what would work best for you, as opposed to just getting kind of caught up in the name brands or getting caught up in whatever it is you may be getting caught up in, whether it's the conference or whether it's the level of play or whether it's whatever, whatever it may be. Maybe it's a hyped up school, like, you know, like a, a school that has a really great football program doesn't mean they're going to have a great volleyball program, you know? And so just understanding that, um, you know, understanding your values and understanding how you're going about um, developing that relationship with the coach who's going to impact your life greatly because uh, we see you like every day. So, um, so you just want to make sure you're proactive in that process as proactive as you can be. And the more options you have, the more overwhelming it gets. And so if you can narrow that down and really spend your time developing meaningful relationships, um, that I think that helps in just understanding um, kind of what you're signing up for, if you will, uh, in that experience. So my two cents. All right, uh, before we wrap things up, um, our final question is basically for all the parents, the student athletes, the club directors and coaches that are listening right now, um, just if you could just give any pieces of advice on what they should be doing or how they should be handling this situation at this time. Um, I, I think, uh, 
because I've done I've done lots of these panels. <laughs> And um, I don't know about you guys, but um, I'm kind of noticing a pattern. I'm, uh, we've been, I've been quarantining now for like eight weeks, I think. And I'm noticing like I'm good for like a week or two. And then like there's a like that third week is not like we're in our rough week with our five year old, too. And it's like this is the rough week. And, you know, then I'll be OK next week, probably. And I'll be OK for the next one. And then it'll be a rough week again. I think first and foremost for everybody, like and especially, I mean, your whole lives, everyone's lives got disrupted is just first of all, just take some time to connect and self-care and take care of your mental and physical health first and foremost, because you can't, you know, this is all overwhelming. Anyway, if, if we weren't doing what we we're doing, this would be overwhelming, right? Recruiting is overwhelming. Uh, and so then to now put it in the framework of the times that we're in, it's I can't even imagine. So first take yourself, take care of yourself and take care of your family and enjoy and um, enjoy this time. Um, as far as recruiting goes, though, I think just trying to use this time to tune in to your own values and expectations of what you're thinking this college experience is going to be, because, you know, it's it's it'll be different probably. But just tune in to your expectations and your values so that you can be proactive with a purpose and a focus and um, that way it'll help you kind of weed through all the noise and you can get a little bit more directed in, in your proactivity, hopefully as you're going through the process as opposed to allowing it to overwhelm you, you can kind of take control of it a little bit better uh, if you're connected and, and with yourself. And I think the probably one of the most important, again, I've never heard a coach say, uh, we don't care how you handle stress. Well, of course we care. Um, and so, I think, you know, once, as I know for me, once I determined physically you can add value to our program, the next thing, the very next question is, do you add value to our program from a cultural standpoint, from a just who you are? Do you do you make us better as people or, or are you going to distract us? And so I think this is an opportunity to learn because uh, we're all stressed. Um, and this is an opportunity to learn and grow and shape who it is you are under stress, because that to me became a really big question is who are you under stress? Um, because we're going to always have stressful moments and the things that we can never predict. Um, you know, you're going to miss if you're traveling by plane and you miss your connecting flight and now you're going to get in at midnight, but we still have to play our match. And, you know, you're going to get home at 2 a.m. on a Sunday and have to be at 8 a.m. class on a Monday. You know, those are always going to be stressful things that are coming up that we can never predict. And so if you can shape and understand who you are in those moments and how you handle stress, um, then you can find a program that's going to fit you better um, and you're going to be able to thrive in that. And I think that this is a great opportunity because we're all we're all a little stressed right now. So that would be my thing. And, I, and my last thing, too, is acad we didn't really touch too much on academics. The only thing I would just also throw out is if you can Google NCAA guide for the college bound student athlete, um, that will give you a lot of information about um, the academic requirements it takes to be NCAA eligible. And then you would have to just contact each institution and each institution has its own requirements. So you would need to, to ask those questions, but, but stay healthy, stay safe and, um, and connect with who you are so that you can navigate um, navigate this process from a place of power and understanding that you're in charge and you know who you are and you know what you're looking for. I would agree with Linda. I mean, I think the only thing I would say in addition to that is the way you show that you're adaptable. And I think that's what we're all looking for is how do you handle stress and can you adapt in certain situations? When a coach, when you do have conversations with a coach, just make sure you're positive. You know. You, Sure, you know, it might be a tough day and you can be honest about that sometimes, but you want to look on the bright side and, and really focus on the positives of, of how you can come out of this situation, but and just be patient. I think the one or two quick little things I'd like to add is I've been finding over the years, um, parents are doing a lot more of a spokespersonship because their daughter is constantly running and sprinting and speeding from one thing to the next and um, families are responding to emails and and text messages and things, sometimes admittedly on behalf of their child, sometimes in, you know, hidden, but we can tell. Um, I think this is a great opportunity where life has slowed down, <clears throat> excuse me, for us that um, sit down and, and have conversations about how to communicate with an adult, uh, what kind of questions to ask, how to truly craft a, a professional friendly email, um, and how to be their own spokesperson because eventually 
we're going to coach that. We're going to coach your daughter. We're not going to coach you. And she has to be able to have those uh, difficult and easy conversations with um, different people in their lives. So I think this is a great time that you have, haven't had a chance yet because of life busyness to sit down and, and really mentor and teach those things. I think the other thing that I'd like to just offer is uh, it's okay to be patient. I mean, higher education will continue to exist in some way, shape, or form. Uh, you'll have a college to go to. Uh, but maybe, you know, we talk all the time, at least in Division Three, you know, make sure you're choosing the school for the school and the athletic side is is the enhancement to the experience. I don't think any of us on this panel right now, because unless I missed a, a memo today, we don't know what what the fall season may or may not look like and if there will be one at this point. So if, if you're a, a 2020 app going to be listening in right now, there's nobody right now that can guarantee you'll even have a freshman season. Um, so really make sure that you probably already made a decision by now, but I think it's cool, or not cool, but good advice for the long haul. You never know what's going to happen in life. I don't think any of us ever thought we'd be trying to manage our teams through a global pandemic. And there was no, there's no textbook in any of the uh, volleyball literature on this. Um, so really just really reassess maybe what you're prioritizing in looking for your next opportunity. Um, and then we're all, we're all competitive and, and high strung people. And I think patience right now is, is uh, more beneficial than anything else. And best of luck to everyone. Um, everything that everyone said, especially with everyone being on the same playing field, you know, half my team didn't even have a ball. So for me to tell them, Hey, touch a ball or whatever, that was not even existing. So, uh, staying in shape, uh, the, the players that are doing stuff now are going to be the ones ready to go. If we do have a season and definitely the players that are motivated right now, will will do that without a coach telling them to. Uh, some things that we're doing is to journal. If you like to write, write it down. This will, this is history right now. So definitely write things down that you're feeling. And sometimes that uh, comes back to, you know, hey, I'm just going to go back and read this. We have added a couple apps to our athletes uh, daily routine. One of them is Calm, C-A-L-M as in man. Uh, a little bit of meditation there definitely gets is being mindful and uh, it helps you with a lot of things that a lot of programs are starting to do a little bit more, especially with not only just on the court, but for their student athletes to be um, how to deal with pressure situations and stressful situations on the court, in the classroom, in your daily, in, in a move, in a, in a new school, uh, dealing with all that. Um, and then one other book that was given to us by another coach that some of our players are reading. So for any summer book readers, the Inner Game of Tennis. Uh, I'd like to plug that one. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure my words actually affect the, the coronavirus, but I think they're kind of important. Um, if you're not interested in a school, please let us know. We're used to dealing with the word no. If you do not send us the word no, we're going to keep contacting you, and that wastes our time, and it aggravates you. Likewise, if you're going to say yes, Try and do that as soon as you feel sure, because if we're recruiting, we have other players and we want to be able to tell them no as soon as possible so that they can go on and look for other schools as well and narrow down their choices. Um, be honest with yourself in that. Um, when you're on a visit, um, we didn't talk much about academics. If the coach does not arrange for a visit with the academic advisor or someone in the department you want to study, this is a red flag. You should, the academics have to be a priority. Make sure you get the chance to talk with the academic people. Um, third, make sure that the coach gives you time to talk with the players without the coach present. If a coach won't let you talk to the players without the coach being present, they're hiding something. Make sure you have the opportunity um, as a recruit to talk with the players. And um, next, number four, I got five of them. Uh, number four, would you still go to that school if it wasn't for the volleyball? You may suffer something that goes on that prevents you from playing volleyball. And if you only chose a school for the volleyball, you may be setting yourself up for a miserable two or four years. This is bad. Um, when the And then the last one, when you make the decision, um, it's great that you love volleyball. It's great that you like the coach, but coaches move on. The people that are there for the most part are your teammates. And on that recruiting visit, when you talk with them, 
uh, the big part of the decision is are these um people that i will be friends with three years from now 10 years from now 25 years from now and as a coach in the long term there is nothing that makes me feel better over the years than having seen the people that have stayed in touch for 20 and 30 years and the memories they have they don't remember their win loss records they don't remember beating certain teams in most situations but they will remember watching matt lick the plate at a restaurant they will remember trish going stinky in the back of the bus and, and and they will remember the songs that Jill started singing and watching Jill rap and, and, you know, Linda cooking meals and burning and starting an alarm that forces the apartment complex empty. This is what they will remember. And it's because they become sisters and brothers. That's the biggie. Awesome. Um, Lindsay, do you have any final words before we wrap this panel up? I uh, just want to say thank you to our panelists. You guys are providing a lot of value to our members right now, so we appreciate your time. And thank you to everyone that um, tuned in today. And if you have any questions about this panel, you can email me at lindsay.smith at greatplainsvolleyball.org. Awesome. Uh, well, that is all the time that we have. Um, I once again would like to thank um, our panelists for taking the time to participate today. And I thank all of you uh, for being able to join us today. Um, I would like to thank uh, once again the Great Plains region for allowing us to get this panel started and uh, just helping us provide a professional network for everyone who is dedicated to enhancing the sport of volleyball. Thank you everyone once again and I hope you have a wonderful evening. Bye, thanks. Thank you.